Um, <clears throat> is there any way we can ask some of the students to move up a little bit? You don't have to, but it's always nice to see. Uh, they sit in the cheap seats. Yeah, yeah. you don't have to sit, sit in the cheap seats. Um, I'm really excited about this uh, conference we're having today. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, but a very timely topic. And uh, as you can tell, our guests are, are really, uh, they're the people who are in the news, who are making the news, and who really know the situation in the Middle East. Um, we're going to have uh, Brian introduce each one of them individually. But before we'd like to begin, we have a special introduction and, uh, of a man who doesn't need any introduction, Father Peter. Thank you, and thank you all for being here this morning. I, I said to the students as I was coming in, were you here for the muffins or were you here for the talk? I was told a little bit of both, so uh, enjoy, enjoy the treats as well. But I think this conversation will be a treat in itself because um, the Middle East has been dealing with many, many issues for a long period of time, and the plight of uh, the Christian religions in the Middle East uh, is a serious consequence right now. And, um, as many of you probably know, the Pope and the Patriarch are actually meeting in Jerusalem, I think it's Jerusalem, this, this fall, um, and they will be discussing the issue of peace and how it is that we as a Christian community from all our different experiences and our traditions can come together to bring um, a sense of peace into a world that needs it so desperately, not only in the Middle East, but in our own communities, in our own country, and we are honored today at Villanova to have so many distinguished scholars who know far more about this topic than I do. And by the end of this conversation, I think all of you will know far more about it as well. So uh, we welcome you to Villanova today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your ideas, um, your solutions, your um, experience with um, addressing some of the issues that we need to do in order to come together as um, brothers and sisters and recognize the value that we give to each other and the life experience that we can share with each other and live in a community of peace that God calls each of us to be in. So one, have a wonderful day. I'm sorry I can't stay. I have uh, some other peaceful issues to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> right. This is really exciting. We're, this is the beginning of a year-long research project that is being conducted by three different organizations. Uh, the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies at Villanova is one of them. The other one is the Center for American Progress, which is a uh, progressive uh, but uh, think tank in, uh, is that the best way to identify yeah. it, in Washington, D.C., and the Arab American Institute, which is an activist uh, Arab American organization. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Brian Katulis. Brian is a senior research fellow at the Center for American Progress, and more importantly, is a Villanova grad, uh, graduated here in 1994, one of the first, uh, well, one of the more distinguished graduates from our Center for Arab Islamic Studies. Uh, the interesting thing today is you'll notice that almost everyone here has a Villanova connection. Hisham Melham, well, you're gonna, you're gonna mention the Villanova connections, will you? All right. So, Brian, please. Great, thank you. Thanks, Marwan. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here at Villanova University. As Marwan mentioned, it was 20 years ago, if you can believe it, that I graduated from this place. And for those of you uh, students in the pack here to get your extra credit for your class, um, uh, I came to Villanova from a small town in central Pennsylvania knew nothing about the world. And what uh, people like Father Ellis and Ann Lesh and all of the professors that are here established and really help launch what I do every day. I wouldn't be doing what I, I'm doing right now, uh, which is research on the Middle East and broader foreign policy, if it weren't for this institution. And I try to come back as much as possible. And that's why I'm honored that we're co-sponsoring this event, as well as a panel that we did yesterday in Washington, D.C., which, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can find on our website at AmericanProgress.org. Um, and, and for those of you students, just as a note, if you, you have an interest, if you're here not only just for the extra credit, if you have a spark in this, Villanova is a great place for helping launch students like you. And in, in no short time, really quickly, you'll be out there. And you'll find the support network in the community, I think, that can put you out in the jobs that you want, and I'm part of that. I welcome any emails, I've handed out my cards to some of the students now, 
uh, if you want to come and intern with us at the center. We're a, a think tank that seeks to affect U.S. policy on multiple issues, whether it's health care here at home or econ policy. I work on national security. Uh, we lean a little bit more center-left, um, uh, but it doesn't matter as much on issues like Middle East policy these days, which is quite complicated and uh, quite confused. So, uh, and we, you know, we have, have some of our papers out back, and if you want to learn more about our work, go to our website, AmericanProgress.org. We really see ourselves as an attempt to bridge the very good work that's done in academia to try to um, link it to policy discussions and debates in ways that, that can change um, U.S. policy. Our main objective today with this first panel, which I'll introduce in a second, is to talk about the present day challenges facing Christians in the Middle East and to uh, analyze those challenges in the context of, of the Arab uprisings, the political transitions, the ongoing conflicts that we see. Uh, whether it be in Syria or the unresolved conflict of the Arab-Israeli conflict. So we're trying to analyze those, those challenges um, that the Christian communities uh, face. The second objective, which we hope to get to in the discussion, is to propose ideas uh, about what actors in the region can do, uh, and then if there are things that uh, U.S. policy, because it's a focus of our institution, can do differently. Uh, either directly on the issue of religious freedom and political pluralism, or more broadly uh, in, in U.S. foreign policy. And this is something I'm personally passionate about, of how do we actually take those uh, issues related to our values, uh, those values of uh, pluralism and inclusivity, and try to apply it in the current context of the Middle East through the lens of U.S. policy, whether it be U.S. government policy or the important work that many non-governmental organizations do, and I've heard a little bit about that um, beforehand. So I think we have no better uh, set of uh, analysts on this first uh, panel. We have a second panel with some very distinguished academics, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning from um, um, in the second panel. Uh, on the first panel, I'll do it in the order of speaking. Uh, first is uh, Rami Khori, who's currently uh, teaching at Princeton University, but is in uh, based in Beirut, Lebanon. I, Rami doesn't know me very well, but I know him, and we all know him, I think him very well through his writings. And when I was on a Fulbright, I think, in Jordan in 1994, 95, I believe you were the editor of the Jordan Times. And um, your, your views have uh, broadly on sort of where the region's going, what U.S. policy should do or shouldn't do, and then on this specific topic really have been important and influential um, um, to me. And we, we're honored to have you here. The second panelist is my good friend uh, Hisham Mellum, who, as Marwan mentioned, uh, graduated a few years before I did at Villanova University. Um, and Hisham's with El Arabiya uh, Television. He often calls me up to come on and debate uh, Egypt and other things with uh, voices in Egypt. But w you'll hear from Nishan his views on this topic, but on the issue of change in the Middle East. Because as we all know, the Middle East is at what I think is a very early phase of complicated change, and an ongoing process of social, uh, demographic, and, and, and political change, which affects uh, uh, the, the specific topic that we're talking about. But we're really honored. And again, I'll, for those of you interested, check out the discussion we had yesterday, because I think it had a lot of uh, great uh, insights. And then finally, last but not least, is uh, Jim Zogby, who uh, wears many hats, but most importantly is the head of the Arab American Institute. And I've known Jim um, um, for about 20 years or so. I think we first met uh, on the first Palestinian elections back in 1996. You were out there, uh, like many of us were, in a much different and I think more hopeful period for the Palestinian situation. And uh, Jim uh, knows a lot about this topic, has done a lot of polling, and we've worked collaboratively um, on, on issues of uh, change in the Middle East and trying to understand what's going on. So this is the general uh, roadmap we're going to do. We've got about uh, about an hour, a little under an hour and a half. I think Rami may have to leave early uh, for to teach a class. We're going to give each of the speakers about 10 minutes to uh, introduce the topic, to discuss some questions that I sent to them uh, about the situation of Christians in the Middle East uh, in this context. And we'll have a bit of a discussion um, for, for about 10, 15 minutes up here. But here's the thing. Think of your questions. Think of the points that you'd like to make from the audience, because as much as possible, I'd like to make this a dialogue, uh, both this panel and, and the second panel in the afternoon. So as the speakers are saying something you disagree with, voice it uh, in the question and answers. Uh, it's the only way. What we're trying to do, as Marwan mentioned, is uh, I've looked at this as more of a framing conference. We, we didn't ask the people to come with papers that presented. We hope that this is the start of a process that will inform mostly qualitative research that 
we aim to do on the topic, but we hope to come back in a year and have a much more structured here is what we've learned in the last year. And I think what we're doing here is trying to dip our toe as an institution into this very complicated topic, understand what people who've been working on this for years uh, are, are thinking about um, and understand what those who shape the media debate uh, and the policy debate are thinking about on this topic. So without further ado, uh, Rami, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Brian. Thank you, Marwan, for all your work and everybody at Villanova for helping be part of this. And uh, I'm very happy to be back uh, again, especially with my two distinguished friends and uh, co-panelists. Um, so in 10 minutes, I'll make a couple of uh, basic points that uh, reflect what I see as a Christian living in the Middle East in Beirut, where I'm, my main work is I had a research center at the Assam Paris Institute at the American University of Beirut. Um, and what I see happening in the Middle East uh, as a Christian, as a Palestinian, Jordanian, as a Levantine, as an Arab, uh, as one of my many other uh, dimensions or, or identities that uh, we can choose from, as, as is the case with most people in the, uh, in the Arab world who have multiple identities. Um, I would say, first of all, that broadly speaking, uh, clearly there is a stress in the Christian communities all across the region. Um, higher rates of immigration, uh, lower birth rates, uh, therefore the relative size of the Christian community to the rest of the population in the Arab world is declining in, in most places. Um, and I think it's important to understand uh, the reasons for that. Uh, one of them clearly, and this has been going on since the 70s. I, mean, I, I lived in Jordan for 30 years. I've been in Beirut now for 10 years. In the 1970s, many Christian, not many, but some Christian friends of ours were leaving uh, Jordan and immigrating, usually to Canada, Australia, the US somewhere. Um, so this isn't a recent phenomenon. This has been going on for about uh, two generations. Um, and the main uh, drivers of this process of the relative shrinking of the uh, Christian population and the Arab, uh, or the populations in the Arab countries is three basic factors. Uh, economics, first of all, um, finding it difficult to make a decent living and take care of your family and uh, have better opportunities for your kids in the future. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, the political stresses and the constraints on people's lives um, as uh, citizens, but also as Christians in some cases, and, and that relates to the third one, which is uh, the, uh, what I mean by political stress is lack of freedoms um, and constraints. Um, and then the third one, which is related to that is, in some cases, you're getting distinct threats against Christians because they're Christians and minorities in some particularly uh, uh, chaotic and violent places uh, like Syria, like Iraq, um, and, and you, you may see that Egypt uh, a little bit. And these, these threats and pressures, kidnappings, uh, bombing churches, whatever, very small numbers of incidents, by the way, um, probably the number of incidents that have been perpetrated against Christians are about the same in proportion to the total population as the number of people who, who bombed abortion clinics in the United States to the total population. So we're not talking about all the Christians running around being scared of being kidnapped, uh, but the, the, because they're targeted as Christians by some fanatic Muslims usually, Salafi, Takfiri, Qaeda type um, extremists, uh, these become exaggerated, particularly uh, in, in the Western media and in some political circles who, especially here in the United States, where you have extremist right-wing groups that specialize in focusing on the, the problems of Christians in the Arab countries, uh, which they blow completely out of proportion. So there are problems. People are kidnapped. There are some churches that have been bombed here and there. Uh, and this has been done by a range of groups. Uh, the bombings in churches, for instance, in Egypt, there's many people, many Egyptians who believe this was indirectly orchestrated by the former Mubarak regime at one point. And other people think it's uh, uh, angry Muslim Brotherhood types. Other people think it's Salafi extremist Muslim Qaeda type uh, Salafi Takfiri extremist. So there's a whole range of accusations about who is actually um, uh, terrorizing or threatening uh, some Christians here and there. But it's important to keep this in its proper uh, 
proportion. And then the fourth uh, threat, I believe, is a little bit self-induced, which is Christians uh, circling the wagons and, and turning into themselves and just saying, look, please let me just ring my church bell and have my Sunday school or the school for, church school for my kids, and that's all I want, and just leave me alone. And now those Christians retreating from the process of nation building and citizenship into a much smaller and therefore much more vulnerable uh, and therefore seen by the majority of society as a little bit more alien group in society that is not in fact playing its role uh, in state building and transformation and reform and, and, and progress. Um, it's also a problem, uh, this isn't only a Christian problem, we, this is part of a wider trend of sectarian polarization. Uh, and you see it all around the region with Sunnis and Shiites and Druze and Alawites and um, uh, Amazigh. And, uh, any group of people is being accentuated as a group that is not Sunni, Muslim, Arab, which is the majority identity of the people in, in most of the Arab world. If you're not Sunni, Muslim, Arab, then you're something else. And if you're something else, you're Shiite, you're Druze, you're Kurd, you're Armenian, you're this, you're that, you're, you're some minority. Um, and this polarization is uh, taking place and has been taking place really since the Civil War in Lebanon, I would say, is this, and we can trace the beginning of this. And then Iraq made it much worse. The Anglo-American invasion of Iraq opened the floodgates to the Qaeda guys, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, and these guys in Iraq who were able, thanks to what George Bush and Tony Blair and Condoleezza Rice and Dick Cheney did, create zones of chaos where these groups <coughs> can take root and start deliberately provoking Shia Sunni tensions, and this has spread into a broader range of, um, of polarization. The third point I would make, oh, but, but in, in relation to that, before I leave that point, Christian life at the community level is vital, is full of vitality, full of uh, tolerance, acceptance, pluralism, hope, uh, humanism. Uh, you look at Christians at their local community level, in most cases, they're living in relatively mixed communities. In some areas, you have distinct Christian villages or Christian quarters, but in most cases, uh, Christians are living very peacefully, very happily with Muslims, Years ago, there used to be Jewish communities. There aren't very many left in the Arab world. So at the local level, there is uh, tremendous amounts of vitality, coexistence, tolerance, pluralism, collaboration, cooperation, solidarity, whatever you want to call it. When you get to the national political level, uh, then uh, you get into the extremist uh, ideological frenzy and, and, and violence. The third point I'd make is the core issue for Christians is not that they're Christians, is that their citizenship rights are denied. And it's the exact same problem that affects all people in the Arab world. So I would argue that we should look at Christians not through the lens of Christianity primarily, but primarily through the lens of citizenship. And all other minorities, in fact all majorities in the Arab world, are denied their fundamental human rights as equal citizens in societies governed by the rule of law. Uh, and equal opportunity. This doesn't exist anywhere, really, in the Arab world. Um, and therefore, the question that we should uh, explore, if we're going to look at Christians, because they are a distinct minority that should be um, looked at for, for, for various reasons, we should do so through the wider lens of citizenship, pluralism, tolerance, coexistence, keeping in mind that uh, the danger of overemphasizing the Christianity of Christians uh, makes them actually more vulnerable. Uh, and I think what we need to do is to explore Christians and Muslims and others altogether to look at opportunities to um, promote the vital engagement of Christians and all minorities and all people in the Arab world in a public political process of uh, reinvigorated state building and nation building and what is happening now across the Arab world in various stages, some of them very violent and messy, others very peaceful and optimistic, like Tunisia, for instance, is this, 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 this historic, unprecedented, unbelievably exciting, heroic process of Arab citizens writing their own constitutions. We're now experiencing the first real possibility of self-determination anchored in the citizenries of these countries. The first time ever, not just in 
in the last 20 years, 30 years, not just since the Arab awakening of 1910, 1920, but uh, ever in Arab history. We've never had <coughs> constitutions written uh, and verified by the citizens of these societies. It's always a small elite, a foreign colonial power, some colonel who takes over from some other colonel, some local warlord who beats up the other wo local warlords, creates a, a country or, a, or a, some kind of sovereign area. This is something that is an amazing uh, opportunity and responsibility for Christians and all others in the region to get involved in this process of self-determination, state configuration, and what is ultimately the process, the first time ever, I would say ever in history, going back seven, 8,000 years of settled human life in this region, the first time ever we see a process of citizen-based national self-determination. That's the optimistic view. It may happen, it may not happen. If you look at Tunisia, you look at Libya, you look at Egypt, there's various signs, some are better than others. Tunisia is the most hopeful. And that's where I think we should focus the role of Christians and any other uh, uh, group uh, that we're looking at. So I'll stop there and t turn it over to my colleagues. Okay, thank great, you. Great, thank you. Well, let me first thank uh, Brian and Father Ellis for um, inviting this lost uh, soul back to Villanova. I spent some wonderful years here. Uh, Villanova was my first window in the United States. Here I struggled with English. Here I met my wife. And um, through this great university, uh, I became more and more fascinated with the United States. And uh, I never planned to stay in the United States when I came back in the it's a confession. I was here in 1972, before most of you were born. Uh, I never thought I'll stay here, and uh, here I am now in uh, 2014, uh, uh, still struggling. And, uh, but this place means a lot to me, and uh, I, was, I was moved this morning to see this once beautiful campus, uh, even more beautiful today and more attractive. So, Congratulations, uh, Father Ellis, and thanks again. Uh, bad times have visited the Christians and other minorities in the Middle East before. They struggled for, since the beginning of the church in what is today Antioch in, in, in Turkey, and Antioch historically was always a northern Syrian city. Uh, but what makes the current situation uh, tragic and truly historic and heartbreaking is that uh, it is taking place uh, in a large swath of Arab land throughout the Middle East, actually, essentially, but mostly in three critical places, Egypt, Syria, and, and, and Iraq. Let's be frank about this. There has always been discriminatory laws against the Christians and other minorities in the Middle East. They are still practiced today from Iran to Egypt. So it's not only, we should talk about it in the context of the Arab uprising, but in the, in the context of historic discriminatory practices against Christians and Jews and other minorities. Usually the state is one of the accomplices when uh, we see acts of violence perpetrated against Christians by radical groups before the uprisings. I can give you many examples in the case of Egypt. And the reason I talk about Egypt is that Egypt is a friendly country to the United States. Egypt receives your tax money and my tax money. And during the long ossified reactionary rule of Hosni Mubarak, our man in Egypt for three decades, many acts of violence occurred against the Coptic community. People were killed. And there was a, an infamous incident in the village of Kushuh in southern Egypt. 23 or 24 Copts were killed by local radical for nefarious reasons. But that's not the issue. The issue was the, the complicity of the state with these people. The state never conducted a serious investigation, and nobody was punished. <clears throat> so 
and, and the, uh, so under Mubarak, the, the Copts did not fare well. Under the SCAF rule, the military who took over after Mubarak, they committed one of the most heinous crimes against the Coptic community, the so-called Maspero Massacre. Then the MB came to power, Muslim Brotherhood, and the discrimination continued. Now it's less so than before. On the day that followed the overthrow of Mursi government in Egypt, 42 churches were torched and burned throughout Egypt. Not only Coptics, but Orthodox, uh, Catholic, others. In hundreds of places owned by the churches, orphanages, hospitals, clinics, schools, you name it. This was the worst attack on the Copts in Egypt since an infamous pogrom that took place against them during the Mamluk era in medieval times. So we're not talking about isolated incidents. And this is in Egypt, the country that I grew up in Lebanon, admiring it because it was more liberal and more open and less violent. You know, there was an, uh, an interesting Egyptian diplomat who used to say, we, Egypt, are the only country in the Arab world that has all the attributes of nationhood. The rest of the Arabs are a bunch of tribes with flags. And there is some truth into that. I mean, Egypt is Egypt. So if these things are taking place in Egypt, you know, we don't want to talk about what's happening in Syria. But I, you know, I, I wanted to put that in context that <clears throat> there is a... There is a uh, a long history of discrimination against, against the uh, Christian communities in the region. Uh, the invasion of Iraq was catastrophic for the Christian community and other communities in Iraq. It was catastrophic. It really precipitated the violence that consumed Iraq and, and dragged Iraq into a civil war in 2005, 6, 7, and 8. And it was in this context, the growing tension and violence between the Sunnis and the Shia, the sectarian violence, where the Christian communities in Iraq were caught in the middle. And again, their bishops were not only kidnapped, but they were killed, and their churches were torched. And uh, in the end, one of the oldest Christian communities in the Middle East is literally disappearing in front of us. From a million plus Christians, today we have less than 200,000. And this is in the span of one decade. And what makes, you, makes me very angry about this is that nobody in Washington owned it. Nobody in Washington did anything about it. And, and the tragedy is when, we, when people talk to the Syrian Christians, you know, uh, we, can, we, can, we can assure you about the future and all that, they point out to a simple fact that under the presence of 150,000 men and women from the American Armed Forces, these uh, calamities were happening to the Christians and nothing, and, and nobody could stop them. Now we come to the uprisings. One should look at the violence now against Christian communities uh, that are taking place in places like Syria and Iraq, but mostly Syria, uh, in the context of you know, two important uh, uh, currents. One is the deteriorating economic conditions in those countries. And, and the other one is, again, this is an unprecedented development in the, in, the, in, in the last 500 years. Sectarianism has always been uh, a fact in, 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 in Muslim governance. Uh, throughout history, uh, Shia communities, or the groups that evolved from, from Shia Twelvers, uh, were marginalized and, and, uh, and, and felt the the discrimination against them by the ruling Sunni elites uh, in, in, in the Arab world. Um, but what is taking place today is truly unprecedented. In the past, we had tension between the Shia and the Sunnis. Today, we have unspeakable violence. And it is not an exaggeration to say that if you, look, if you imagine the map, we don't have a map here of the Middle East, you can talk about a, uh, uh, a continuum front from Iraq to Syria to Lebanon, of sectarian bloodletting. 
I would argue, and I've been arguing, that the war in Iraq and the war in Syria have morphed into one. There is a nasty new group called ISIS, uh, this is the Islamic State in, in, in Iraq and, and the Levant, uh, that is fighting in both countries. And so what is taking place now in terms of the Sunni Shia violence is truly unprecedented and we've never seen anything like it in modern times. And again, in the middle, the Christian communities are caught. And, and, and uh, ISIS and other, other groups, uh, uh, Islamic groups in, in, uh, in, in Syria have been uh, in the name of jihad against uh, the regime of Bashar al-Assad uh, are uh, uh, committing incredible, incredible violence against Christian communities. Now, I want to hasten and say quickly <laughs> that the regime in Damascus has diabolically used sectarianism to perpetuate itself in government for, for more than 40 years. And um, uh, now it claims publicly that it is a, sect a secular regime, just as Saddam Hussein claimed publicly, and he was lying to his, through his teeth that he's a sectarian, he was never sect uh, that he was secular. None of these regimes, even when they were talking about Arab nationalism, they were essentially sectarian regimes. Uh, Saddam's rule was based on the Shia, on the Sunni minority in Iraq and in, in Syria. The core of the current regime is the Alawi core. The Alawis are an offshoot of Shia Islam. They represent no more than 12% of the population. And uh, uh, the leaders, all the security agencies and all that, they're all uh, uh, Alawis. And uh, that's why the venom that you see on the part of many Sunni Islamist radical groups is because of uh, the nature of the regime too. So both the regime and these new volunteers who come from all over the world actually, not only from the Arab world, but they come from far away, Dagestan and Chechnya and all that, to, to do jihad now. Syria is, is, the, is, the, is the magnet now for the jihad just, jihad, just as Afghanistan was in the 1980s against the Soviet occupation. And, uh, and we've seen some really unspeakable acts of violence, uh, sectarian violence and uh, violence against the Christians um, including kidnapping uh, nuns, burning churches, executing uh, and kidnapping uh, 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 priests. Now, now I agree with, with Rami that uh, the issue for the Christians is not to struggle for Christian rights or for their right to worship only or, uh, uh, or to act like a minority. I think they should struggle. Uh, their struggle should be in the context of the overall struggle for empowerment, for human rights, for civil rights, for political rights, for rights of citizenship uh, uh, under new modern constitution in civil states. Um, it's no longer sufficient to say Islam is tolerant. Yes, actually one you know, should give Islam a credit that in ancient times or in medieval times when Muslims were powerful and ruling empires, they treated the Jews and the Christians better than, let's say, the Jews were treated in, you know, by my, my co-religionists in Spain before the Arabs came. Uh, uh, but we're not living in a middle system. Um, uh, the issue is not to protect the minorities. Uh, I never looked at myself as part of a minority. Uh, I, 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 I resented when people say, uh, we tolerate the Christians. I don't need tolerance. I don't want tolerance. I don't want protection. I want the protection of a modern day constitution that protects me as a member of the society, as a citizen with full rights, not as a subject, that protects me, protects the citizen regardless of religious identification, ethnic identification, or, or gender. And this, this is where the struggle should be. So uh, uh, that's why I find myself struggling uh, to explain how, uh, how, I, how we should deal with this issue. This is not, should not be approached as you know, only, only uh, right to worship or uh, uh, Christian minorities. It should be approached as, uh, as part and parcel of the overall struggle uh, uh, for, uh, for human rights. Um, there is also a Christian responsibility for what's taking place. I think Christians in the past made the mistake of allowing themselves to be used either by colonial powers or by the local leaders who took over after the end of formal, formal, formal uh, uh, 
colonial administration or the mandate systems, uh, where they allowed themselves to be used by a regime like the one in, Saddam, uh, in Iraq, under Saddam, or in Syria, or even in Jordan, other places. Uh, I mean, Saddam wanted someone who speaks English, so he goes to Tari Aziz, a member of the Christian community. Now, obviously, the Christians were, were educated uh, when, when the new states were born after the colonial era, and, and many of the local leaders relied on them, relied on their services, relied on their skills, relied on their contacts with the West, relied on their education. Uh, but that really helped isolate them and helped um, uh, uh, the majority Christians in many cases, or in some cases at least, to resent them. Um, so now when we discuss the situation in Syria, people say, well, the Christians are concerned and they will be protected by this regime. If this regime is gone, there's no protection. This is the wrong way of framing the issue and looking at the issue. Uh, two days ago, there were reports that the Pope, that the Coptic Pope in Egypt, um, in an interview, called General Sisi a hero and called on him to, to run for the elections, for, you know, for the presidency. And he, he criticized the Arab uprisings. Uprisings. He claimed that they are the uh, uh, results of foreign machinations and all that. Of course, he tried to deny it later on, but I saw parts of that interview with my own eyes, so I don't know how he can deny it. The point is, the, the Pope of an incredibly important Christian community, the largest communi Christian community in the Middle East, 10 million people, what he did was unworthy of that community. What he did is unworthy of that community and unworthy of his position. He shouldn't put himself under the protection of a general who wants to be the new Nasser of Egypt. That's the worst thing an important religious leader can do. So uh, uh, there is, again, you know, a, a Christian responsibility, and the Christians themselves in the, in the Middle East should look critically at, at some, of the, uh, some of these practices. Finally, what the United States can and should do. Um, as we were discussing yesterday, President Obama made a big issue, correctly so, about how uh, 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 the Russian government was discriminating against the gay community before the Sochi Olympic Games. And he raised that issue and made it an international issue in, in the Sochi Games, Winter Games, in the uh, you know, last few weeks. I think the issue of the plight of the Christians and others should be raised by the president. But again, not in the strictly speaking as a Christian issue, but as uh, another manifestation of what's taking place in the Middle East and what's happening to human rights in general. I mean, if people are being discriminated against in Russia and we raise issue about that and we raise hell as we should, we should raise hell too about people who are being killed just because of their ethnic background or religious background in the Middle East. And I think, uh, uh, especially in those countries that get your tax money and my tax money, like Egypt and others, I think the president should uh, say that our aid should be, should, be, uh, should be conditioned. And if you want to come and get money from the IMF, uh, we will help you. But again, you should respect you know, basic, basic human rights. I think the United States can do something, can, can, can influence events. This is not a fight for the United States, but the United States can help uh, 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 put pressure on, on, on these regimes. And I think American civil society, American NGOs, American media, American churches, and other groups uh, can help, but again, they should be extremely careful in, in, in not appearing as if we are only, uh, I mean, to talk about the Christian rights, as I said, in the context of broader human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. Oops. And I am going to move this. Not that they're not pretty, but I'd rather look at my one. <laughs> see if he's wincing or frowning. Or, uh, thank you. My connection is all no, but it's more like uh, six degrees of separation. Um, uh, it was the family school uh, back in the 30s, if you look in uh, college. The, the annual, the, the yearbook, you'll find a lot of zombies here. Um, I didn't go to, uh, here. I went to Le Moyne and chose a Jesuit school, which uh, caused a little bit of internal family stuff. Um, and I taught at Rosemont. Uh, Hisham, I was teaching at Rosemont in 1969, so I, I'm teaching. Uh, I'm older. Um, I um, uh, was a 
Temple, got my PhD in comparative religions, and uh, did some postdoctoral work at Penn and then at Princeton in religions under stress. Uh, and what happens to uh, in in situations where um, people of different backgrounds are under stress, how they react and how religion plays a role in, in that. So I'm going to take a slightly different tack uh, and look at this um, uh, without disagreeing with my, my colleagues on the panel because the content they present is, is absolutely uh, correct. Um, but I want to create a different context and a, maybe a way of looking at the problem. And I, I think it's so important that CAP and Villanova uh, are doing this, and we're proud to be a partner with you because it's an issue that really requires, I think, deeper understanding because we're gonna, it's going to be with us for a long time. And as Hisham notes, it's been with us for a long time. It's not going away. Um, let me just begin by, by saying that one of the problems is, is ignorance, profound ignorance in the United States about the Middle East. I remember when I was running something called the Palestine Human Rights Campaign back in 1979, I, I brought a, uh, a priest, a Catholic priest from the Galilee to uh, uh, a press breakfast with religion reporters from uh, assembled in Washington. Uh, Gannett had somebody there, and AP, and back when UPI was UPI, they had somebody in the Post and the Times, et cetera. And one reporter uh, from a prominent wire service uh, began the questions by saying, it, it's so interesting. You describe yourself as Arab? and a Christian. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? And follow up, uh, when did your people convert? <laughs> he looked and he said, maybe 2,000 years ago. <laughs> but if they had known that in the process of hearing the words of Jesus and accepting them uh, and becoming Christian, they would have disinherited themselves, um, they might have had second thoughts. Um, in any case, it, it hasn't got much better. And during the entire, as Hisham notes, during the entire Iraq war, the issue was totally invisible. In the Bush administration world, they were warned about it, and they ignored it completely. It didn't exist as an issue or a problem. Um, and throughout the region, that exists. And now it's been discovered. Certainly by the, the folks on the far right, it's been discovered. And it's become part of the Islamophobic narrative. Um, well, this is. Muslims, this is how they are. This is what the, the, blo the violent, bloody uh, Muslim, blah, 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 and it goes on from there. Well, I, I want to pull back a minute and look at it because, because it, it is a serious problem. And in each one of the countries, uh, there is a problem from Iraq and, 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 and in Syria, no doubt, uh, and in Egypt. And, you know, the tensions that exist in Lebanon can boil over at any time and, and put pr Christians there at, at risk. It's a precarious situation. Um, and Christians in Palestine, uh, similarly, uh, have been disinherited in, in, in many more ways than just as a result of being Christian, but also because they are Arab and Palestinian and so have lost their rights and their land and their access to holy places, etc. But it needs to be demystified. Um, it is not unique to the Arab world or to the Muslim world. Um, it is not unique to any particular country. Uh, look, we're, we're in the, the, the anniversary year of the beginning of the, the, the Hundred Years' War, we might say, that Europe uh, underwent. Um, almost 100 million people died on the continent in some of the most bloody conflicts imaginable. And not to speak of anything else, but six million Jews were, were destroyed, an, an entire community devastated. I read an article in the Washington Post um, a couple of months ago about the decline of Europe and the, the, uh, the decline of liberty. As Europe is in decline, we'll see a decline in liberty because Europe was the birthplace of liberty and of civilization, and so as Europe goes, so goes the, the, the struggle for liberty and democracy. It was written by a Brit, nothing against Brits, but for God's sake, I mean, he's writing about the great 19th century writers in Britain who brought us liberty. Talk to the Irish for a minute. Uh, talk to people in the Arab world. Talk to people in West Africa. Talk to people in India. 
um, and the subcontinent generally. And you get a very different picture of the bloody Brits, as they would call them, and their respect for liberty and, and democracy. Um, the conflicts, the conflict in Ireland, for example, or the engineered conflict between religious groups that the British brought with them in West Africa, in South Africa, in India, the subcontinent, etc., cetera, um, were, were not a function of liberty. It was a function of imperial conquest and the use of religion um, by the, the British um, to achieve control in, in each of those regions. And when they implanted a Jewish community in Palestine, the words of Lord Shaftesbury were, what better group than the Jews to help control the northern part of the, the Suez Canal for our interests? I mean, they saw everything through that lens. Um, and so it's not only un not, not unique to the region. I mean, we get the Hundred Years' Wars and the Thirty Years' Wars. I mean, the conflict between Catholics and Protestants. I used to say at one point that, that we probably killed more people in the name of Christ than souls we saved in his name. Uh, it might be an exaggeration, but the point is lots of blood in our history. I mean, if you, if, and if you saw the, the, the way missionaries operated with the indigenous people of North America or the way Baptists operated with, I mean, if you look at pictures, I remember this, uh, uh, an African-American minister once describing a picture that he had on a slide of a, of a lynching in the South. He said, it's interesting if you look, every time you see a picture of the lynching, people got their Sunday best on. And he said, it's because they did it right after service. And, and they went to, it was Sunday go to meeting, they did their service, and then they went out and lynched the, lynched the slave. Um, as, as a, it, was, it was seen in the context of their faith. These were the, the sons of Ham, the, the disgraced son of Noah, who had laughed at their father when he got drunk after the flood. And therefore, God punished them by marking them and making them a slave to their brothers. Um, so a little bit of clarity here and a little bit of focus and context. When we have societies under stress who strike out internally against others in their society, it is not unique to any particular group. The language they use is different. Maybe the, 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 the way that they frame it is different. But it is societies reacting to stress. Um, and, uh, and so it's not a question of theology. It's not a question of, uh, if, if you listen to what the Islamists will say about Christians, or if you listen to what the, I mean, there's an article in the Washington Post this Sunday, the Ku Klux Klan saying, we are not a, 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 a racist group, we're a Christian group. And we're defending the, the purity of our Christian heritage and race. Uh, don't listen to what they say. See what they do. Um, it, 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 we tend to sort of sit, you know, you know, high on our on our on our on our, our current situation and say, ah, we don't have these problems, but look at them. They have these problems. We have them too. We have them too. Uh, I, I used to say that, um, you know, when. When, uh, when you get really mad at somebody and you say, God damn it, doesn't mean I'm actually saying, I hope that God sends him to burn in the everlasting fire. It means I'm mad. Um, when I remember one time I walked in the house and I, I was angry at something and I used the foul, vulgar term and my mother said, Ugh, how can you say that? I said, that's not what I mean, Mom. What I mean is I'm really upset at something that just happened. Um, similarly, when people use religious language um, to describe their feelings or their attitudes or their behavior or their aspirations, it is not an expression of faith. It's usually an expression of their inten the intensity of what they want or what they don't want or how they feel about something. And as to, to use a Catholic term, they'd sprinkle holy water on it by using the most evocative language they can think of, um, which frequently becomes religious language. So it becomes God this, or God that, or Jesus this, or, or whatever in any other tradition. Um, don't look at what they say, look at what they do. And understand that what they do is being justified by the language, it's not the other way around. The language isn't the motivator, the language is the justifier. Um, what is taking place in these conflicts 
is therefore not a religious issue. It often is, as Hisham would describe in the Lebanon situation or in the, the Iraq or, or the, 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 the Syria situation, it's a power conflict. It's a conflict between groups. It's a conflict sometimes between regions or between, um, between uh, families or, or, um, uh, or between tribes um, who may or may not have different religious backgrounds um, and so will use religious language or fall back on religion. I mean, to say my tribe is better than your tribe is one way of putting it, but to say God ordains it to be this way is an entirely different way of saying it. Uh, the one is far more evocative, more powerful than, than, than the other. And so the, the causes of this are, are not in the beginning theological, although it takes a theological hue. The causes are social and political. And in most instances, what I would say is that sectarian conflict, when it occurs, is usually, or extremist movements when they occur, are a function of social, political dislocation and economic dislocation. Uh, intense dislocation creates this tendency toward extremism. The tendency toward sort of reflecting on or, or embracing a, a golden past, wanting to purify the society, wanting to use or somehow uh, justify extreme violence by the need to, for self-purification or purification of the tribe or of the, or of the, or, or of the country. Um, the, one of the examples we always used to study was the great ghost dance. You know, the, the Indians had been pushed across the continent uh, for, for decades and decades and decades. The dislocation was intense. They had gone through many of these revival movements of ways, how could we get back? How could we? Finally, a prophet comes to them and says, if you dance the dance of the elders, if you, if you go back to the old ways, um, you can bring back the, 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 the elders who've died. You can bring back the buffalo, and you'll march across the continent, because it, it first occurred on the west coast, march across the continent and push the white men into the sea. And so the Indians danced and danced and danced, and the white men, the cavalry saw it, and they got nervous, uh, and they went down and slaughtered them. Um, and it was, a, it was a tragic moment. The Indians never were going to take up arms. The natives were never going to take up arms. But it was the, the, the loudness and it was the violence of the ritual that caused people to get nervous. Um, that, that was just one instance, but there are many other examples of these kinds of um, what we would call, in some instances, Salafi movements or Takfiri movements, movements where, where you know, to purify the tribe and to reach back to a golden era, if only we could be the way we were, then everything would go away. The, the, the Americans would go away, the Jews would go away, the, the whoever, the Christians would go away. And nothing to do with theology, it has to do with dislocation and wanting to reclaim a past and find some security. Um, I, I, in some ways, the Tea Party has that aspect to it here. I mean, in the period of the, the, the turn of, from the Bush administration to the Obama administration, think about it. I mean, we had a situation where, as a result of that economic downturn, people lost 20 to 30 percent of their net wealth. About one in every five homes were in danger of foreclosure. Unemployment doubled in a period of just several months. Um, and who were most affected were the middle class and the largely white middle class. And in the context of all of that, uh, you had an African American guy get elected president with a funny name. I mean, people reached out with hope to this new voice that was on the horizon. But when the white middle class, the white male middle class woke up and saw it, initially there was acceptance and then there was this sense of, of what the hell is this all about? Everything is slipping away from me. Um, and it made sense to them to put the blame on him, this foreigner, this strange guy. He wasn't born here. He's not like us. He's not one of us. He doesn't share our values. He's not a real American like us. They used that, and then it morphed into more than that. He's a Muslim. And a lot of the anti-Muslim sentiment that took place during the period 19, 2009, 2010 was really an anti-Obama uh, movement. Um, it was a, a way of sort of moving the, the white middle class that if you looked at the Tea Party, that's who it was. It was white, it was middle-aged, middle-class white guys who felt dislocated, who felt threatened, 
and so embraced a kind of an extremist message uh, to give them a sense of uh, understanding and security uh, that they could reclaim, as, as Mitt Romney said in 2012, our America, to bring our America back. What the hell does that mean? It means uh, an America, leave it to beaver and white guys. That's what it meant. And it was scary to them. You got gay people, you got black people, you got Hispanic people, you got all these strange guys running around, young kids doing this and that and the other, and, and I'm losing my status in society. And so there was this enormous sense of pressure and threat, and people reacted. If you think about it that way, then understand that when you got the guys from the desert moving into the cities in Riyadh, or the, the, the famine in Syria, the, the, the drought in Syria causing people to move south toward urban centers, that sense of dislocation, the sense of being uprooted and being under stress and pressure creates this fertile ground for an extremist notion to occur of how can I regain, reclaim the past? How can I reclaim my strength? But the final issue is how do we deal with it? How does America deal with it? Well, I think gingerly, uh, certainly not sitting on a high horse and dictating terms. When we poll in the Middle East and we ask people, what do you want? They want jobs, they want health care, and they want education. Sound familiar? That's what we want. I mean, that's what people want everywhere. When we ask them, what do you want from America? Um, first thing they say is they want Arab-Israeli problem solved. They used to say they want us out of Iraq because that's the frame of reference. The next thing they say they want is they want economic investment and jobs and health care and education. They do not want democracy from us. They do not want preaching. I mean, the same way that we would not have looked kindly at the Brits or the Canadians coming over and telling us how to do a health care system. And we certainly wouldn't have accepted the Swedes coming over and telling us how to deal with gun control. Um, it would have been looked at as a foreign intrusion into our domestic debate. But what they do want from us is help in building the structure of their society. And so my, 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 my answer to how should America deal with it is, yes, we have to criticize uh, extremism when it occurs. And of course we have to deal with violence, especially if it threatens us. But we also have to speak out for justice, to be, to be clear. But the more effective way of dealing with it is what President Obama tried to do in his 2009 State Department address, the year after Cairo's speech, when he said, we didn't start this uprising, we can't direct its outcome. What we can do is help people and he proposed an agenda of job creation and uh, providing assistance in health care and education to help build these societies and help create a middle class. That is, after all, the cornerstone of any democratic movement is a secure middle class. If you peel away the onion and deal with the problems that exist, uh, that's the way to help move societies forward. It's a long road, but it's the long road that ultimately produces an outcome. But for America to start dictating uh, as I'm a member of a commission in Washington that deals with religious freedom, and some of the problems that have existed on the commission in the past years from neoconservatives and the right wing sort of sitting there and, and sort of preaching at other countries, they're preaching at other countries while Abu Ghraib is coming out, the stories about Abu Ghraib, or while the stories of torture are coming out, or while we're still involved in Iran. I mean, the point is, is that to have moral authority, to reclaim moral authority, you have to have it in the first place. You have to be able to speak uh, from a position of having been able to make a real difference in people's lives. Um, and uh, we may not know their history, but they know ours in many ways. They know the way we've impacted their history. And so I, I would say that, that uh, humility is always in order, but more important than humility is addressing real problems where they are and solving them. And the first layer of the problems is to recreate it, to create a sense of security and stability in, in, in people's lives in, in those countries. And I think that uh, Hisham is absolutely right. I mean, what, we don't always do it right. Previous administrations have done it wrong, and this administration did it wrong. When President uh, Obama went to Cairo and gave that speech, uh, on Islam, I thought it was great that he did it, but he started talking about protecting minorities in the Middle East, and Christians and, and others, small groups, said, no, that's not what we want. We want to be equal citizens of our own countries. America had a chance to send a different message. Instead, they fed right into the narrative of the Islamic movements um, that say, yes, we'll take care of you and protect you, pat you on the head, you protected people. And, and we, we, we blew it at that point. So I think, you know, the, the um, 
the, the, the problem is real. How you address the problem is, is different, I think, than people have proposed. And the, the first thing is to know a little more and see a little more clearly that the problem that exists there is no different than the problem that has existed in many other places around the world, and to look at it through those eyes. It will give us a different sense of how to address it and how to, how, how to solve it ultimately. Thank you. Thanks, Jim and um, Hisham and Rami. I thought that was a very rich introduction to the topic. And I wanted to just ask uh, maybe one question before we open it up to any questions you have in, uh, in the audience. It's clear that the common threads in your presentations um, offer a diagnosis of the current situation. And I don't think there's much divergence in that diagnosis of the situation. And this afternoon, the reason why I hope you stay or come to the panel this afternoon is I think we'll try to deepen that diagnosis in the historical context and talk about some of the things we touched upon on the colonial period and things like this. Uh, the, the question I wanted to ask was centered on what can be done from the region? Jim, you just finished on what the US can do, and maybe we'll get to that, um, importantly, but uh, you all know the region very well. Around you live there, uh, you engage in the media, and your leaders, all of you, in your own right. And all three of you paint a picture of the political um, and sectarian situation, the polarization that has led to a very violent period and has only gotten worse, as uh, I think one of you described the, the Civil War of Lebanon, spreading in some ways uh, this dynamic um, um, throughout. And I think you very rightly all said that this is all about power um, in, in, in the social and, and political context. You also point to the economic factors that undergird all of this. What can be done by the leaders of the region? When I talk leaders, I mean not only the leaders of the government, because as we know, you know, all of these governments face their own legitimacy challenges um, in some way or another. What can be done by thought leaders, people who are in the media? Uh, we've seen this explosion and revolution, some of which you've participated in, in over the last 20 years in media. And I, I, I'll express my own view here is that I think in many ways that media has often been used to further accelerate these divisions towards sectarianism as opposed to bridge um, divides. So again, I'm exposing my bias here. I think a lot of political change needs to come organically from the societies in which uh, uh, these dynamics are happening. With that question, what, you know, what do you think can be done, either by the government leaders or other thought leaders in, in key societies? And I know each, each countries are different, but, but how do we stop this? A movement towards the brink of further sectarianism and violence. Um, I think really there's two levels at which we have to analyze the situation. The, the much bigger level, which is far more complex and far more difficult, but ultimately will prove to be the one that brings a solution, is the level of the coherence and integrity and efficacy of the state, the nation state. The problem, I believe, in most of the Middle East, is that the structures of statehood that we have, uh, that we live in, whether created by retreating European colonial powers or marauding local um, uh, bands of uh, 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 Bedouins and uh, um, local people who created countries, um, the state structure that exists today has never been validated by its own citizens and therefore creates levels of incoherence, corruption, violence, uh, massive abuses of power, denial of human rights to millions and millions, hundreds of millions uh, of people. So that ultimately, that's the uh, ultimate solution. If you look, one of the things that's happening and has been happening in the last, I would say, 20 years or so, is the slow fraying at the edges of many of the countries especially in the Levant and, uh, and, uh, and parts of the Gulf region and, and the Nile Valley. And Sudan split, South Sudan split peacefully. Um, there's discussions going on by many people thinking about, well, is Iraq going to stay together? Will Syria become many states or decentralized federal state or something? The, every country has problems with minorities, with borders. There are essentially no borders between the Mediterranean Sea and the and the Iran-Iraqi border. Iraq, I, I would go further than Hisham say it's Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon have essentially become one battlefield. 
and the single greatest uh, mobilizer, trainer, uh, and exporter of Salafi, Takfiri, terrorists, and jihadis. Um, and uh, the problem is with these states. These states don't make much sense. The people have very little respect for their governments. This is all documented in polling from Zagbi polls to, to uh, Gallup and, and many others. Um, so the state ultimately has to make sense to its own people. Uh, and, and that's the bigger long-term uh, project. The, in the short term, you're seeing people starting now to try to define their national values, which will be focused on issues of identity and of, of equality and of minority full rights and total citizenship rights to all. The debates that have happened in Egypt and Tunisia, especially in Tunisia, have been stunning, in my view, in showing what a, a decent Arab society can actually do if it's given the chance to do so. They've talked about Arabism, they've talked about women's rights, they've talked about minorities, uh, the role of Islam and religion in the state, and they've reached some reasonable compromises that still need work, as you know, from your constitution. You can write a constitution, then you have to redo it 10 years later, and then do a whole bunch of amendments, and then wait another 150 years till women get the rights, and another 200 years till black people get the rights. So it takes time to actually put those constitutions into action. Uh, but uh, the process has started uh, for the first time seriously in Tunisia, certainly. Egypt is still bumpy. Um, so you, I think what you need is a much more honest, open, public discussion uh, about fundamental political rights, uh, human rights, and citizen rights uh, in these countries. That's a long-term process. In the, in the short term, I think there needs to be a, a clear application of the law by the state, but most of these states, as we've uh, seen in the last 20, 30 years, are complicit in some of these human rights denials. and pressures against uh, uh, minorities. So, so I would argue, again, that I think starting at the local level is much more coherent and in the long term will provide much more uh, positive movement than trying to start at the, uh, at the top. So you, you can have religious leaders meeting and talking, and they've done that for a long time. You can have ethnic leaders meeting and talking, but it doesn't translate into changes at the, uh, at the community level. So I would start from the bottom up. Well, obviously, the Arabs have to own their own present and their own future and determine their own future. Um, in the foreseeable future, I, I would have to tell you that I'm very pessimistic. Um, you know, sometimes I know that I sound like a Cassandra, you know, talk about gloom and, and doom. But when I look around at the Arab world, when I look at the uh, class of intellectuals or the political classes uh, that are running most of the Arab states, even in those states that are seen as the final homeland of their own people. This is Egypt, for instance. We're not talking about new constructs. We're talking about the oldest country in the world. These people invented you know, bureaucracy and, and central government. Even in a place like Egypt, uh, 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 when I look at the next five years, six years, 10 years, I'm not, I'm not optimistic. In fact, I was very disillusioned. That maybe I shouldn't be. But I, I was very disillusioned with, with many of those people who took to the streets in January of 2011, because many of them, including the so-called secularists, my own people, uh, turned out to be not liberal. Not liberal. The so-called uh, Tamarud group uh, are supporting the, 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 the coup. Now, what happened in Egypt was a coup. It's true that the rule of the, the one-year rule of the MB, or the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, was, was catastrophic. But what happened? You know, when, when people who took to the streets asking for empowerment, for freedom, supporting a military violent crackdown against people. I mean, we used to make jokes about the lousy Syrian army and the Iraqi army and other armies who showed their, you know, uh, uh, ferocity of killing their own people in their own streets, not fighting, not fighting to, defend the home, to defend their homeland. And we, we never thought that the Egyptian army would shoot the people in the streets. And they did it. And hundreds of people were mowed down. And many of those people who, who demonstrated early on uh, against the Mubarak regime supported the coup, supported the crackdown, supported the putsch, if you will. So we need all, all of us, the Islamists and others, those who believe in political action, not in violence, to rethink some of our assumptions. 
to engage in introspection, to do some self-criticism. I know most people don't like to do that in most societies. We don't like to do it here, too. I didn't see introspection after Iraq. And I'm not seeing it in the Arab world. One of the biggest voices that were absent in this whole thing in the Arab uprising was the voice of the Arab intellectuals. Most of them are either bought or silent or intimidated or go with the flow. And the worst culprit is the Egyptian media. Many of the worst culprits are people who belong to my profession in the media. Those who were, were you know, singing the praise for Mubarak, sang the praise for the scaf, the military rule there, sang you know, the praises for the Muslim Brotherhood, and now they are lionizing Sisi. And I mean, you know, we want the United States to get involved in our affairs. We want to drag the United States into our little fights. And when the United States tells us to do something or suggest something, oh, the imperialists are back. Arabs always you know, complain about the imperialists. The imperial era and the colonial era ended 50, 60, 70 years ago. India and Pakistan were born at the same moment. How come India is a democratic state with all the problems and Pakistan is not? Egypt, essentially, as a modern state, was born at the same time. In the early 1960s, GDP in, in, in Egypt was equal to GDP in South Korea. South Korea. Look at South Korea today and look at Egypt where it is today. And what do you see today in Egypt? Hypernationalism that borders on chauvinism. We don't need the Americans. We don't need this. They need the Americans. They need aid. It's a crumbling society. It's a dying society. And you don't find any Egyptian who had en enough guts and intellectual integrity to talk about this. But it's easy to dump it on the Zionists. It's easy to dump it on the Americans. It's easy to dump it on colonialism. I mean, books were written about this. But there is no soul searching. 40 years ago, the Egyptian army crossed the Suez Canal to liberate China from the Israelis. 40 years later, the Egyptian army is still fighting in Sinai, fighting Egyptians, an Islamist radical movement. Egypt is a pauper state, and the Egyptians are responsible for it, and nobody talks about this. Sudan was broken up. I'm happy for it. If the Kurds want to go their own separate way, I'm with them. It's self-determination. And if some of these states were, were made by colonial powers and there were lines in the sands, well, deal with it. If I'm a Kurd in Iraq, I would seek self-determination. I don't want to live with the Arabs. And I'm an Arab. I mean, we should, we should be honest about this whole thing. Yes, there are issues of identity of, of, of uh, I mean, you take Algeria. I mean, the whole issue in Algeria is still the issue of identity. Are we Arabs? Are we Africans? Are we Muslims? Are we Mediterranean? Are we Amazir? What the hell are we? Tunis may, do, may, 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 may go through the transition. Why? Because they had a, had a leader at one time. I mean, they had, you know, Tunis had a long tradition of reform. Tunis, by the way, in the year 1846, abolished slavery 17 years before the United States. There was a strong president in, each, in, in, in Tunisia who said, I don't want polygamy. I want to send women to school, whether you like it or not. One of the reasons why Tunis is doing, today, doing well today, relatively well today, is because of women's education. In 1957, Bourguiba gave women the right to vote. In this country, women got the right to vote in 1920. But you don't see Tunisians you know, beating their chest and complaining about the West. But many Arabs wallow in victimhood and they love to wallow in victimhood. And they rarely engage in self-criticism. Self, self, self and I say this as I mean, my, my people should do that. I mean, the secularists. But also the Islamists should do that. And we should be honest when we talk about political Islam. I have a jaundiced view of political Islam. 
I have a jaundiced view of anybody who wants to drag religion into politics. And I'm not naive enough. I know that people do it all the time, even in the West. But I want to look at the Islamists and say to them, you have a problem with two people in society. You have a problem with women, and you have a problem with non-Muslim groups. So when we talk about full citizens' rights, we have to live with this. And they need to be challenged intellectually. I don't want to beat them up and kill them in the streets as the Egyptian government is doing. But when these people tell me Islam is al-hal, Islam is the solution, I don't believe it. And there is no such thing. There are modern solutions to these modern complex problems. And we should not beat around the bush. And there are many people in this country, we made a cottage industry, I talked about this yesterday, who keep telling us that the best thing that happened ever happened to the Arab world are the Muslim movements there. No, they didn't. This is one of the worst things that happened to us. And we should be honest about this. That's it. Jim, do you have any? Just, uh, you know, you just heard an example of, of introspection and self-criticism. Um, it is happening, Hashem, and people like you are playing a role in it. I think that's very important. Um, and, and, and really all I add is that I am not I do not look at this uprising as tragic and as grotesque as it has become in some areas, um, as something that um, is uh, is reversible. It is it has unleashed a, a dynamic that is very real, um, and even in Egypt, uh, the, there's no going back. I understand the hysteria that exists, and it's, I find it disturbing. People who I respected, um, you know, sort of roll their eyes back in their heads and start, you know, waxing poetic about the, the general. But in the last poll that we did, um, the general's numbers are just slightly higher than the previous President Morsi's numbers. And the numbers of the Muslim Brotherhood have not dropped significantly. Um, and when you asked the question back in May of 2013, what's the best outcome? 90-something um, percent said uh, national dialogue and reconciliation. And uh, when you asked about what about the military intervening, 56% opposed. In uh, August, we did the same, asked the same questions. And guess what? Still 90% said national reconciliation and 50 some percent opposed the military taking over. When we polled again months after the military took over and said, what do you think about the military takeover? 50 some percent opposed it. And 80 plus percent, 80, high 80 percent said national reconciliation uh, among all the groups. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think it's really quite astounding to me that with the media hysteria and the sense that is you know, it occur, it, you know it, the, the idea that Egyptians just rolled with this it, again. It's not, look, I was in the Democratic. I'm on the Democratic National Committee. I'm the chairman of the Resolutions Committee. And in 2003, I tried to introduce the resolution before the Iraq War to oppose the Iraq War. And I was told uh, by the chairman of the time, now the governor of Virginia, you can't do that. We stand shoulder to shoulder with our president, and we don't want to look weak. And I, he said, finally, after a big war, I mean, we had this enormous debate, I was allowed to speak for the resolution and get a standing ovation for it, but I was not allowed to have a vote on it because we didn't want to embarrass uh, the party as we were approaching elections. I mean, it's like in, in the context of, of stress and dislocation, people react bizarrely. And we did. It took us a while to catch up. You know, Howard Dean sort of broke the ice, and we went from Howard Dean to you know to uh, uh, you know a broader movement in the Senate and the House to deal with it. And we elected a president who opposed it. Is, is that? But it took us a long time, and we're, we still haven't dealt with Iraq and the consequences of it. So I mean, I, I give the Egyptians a, you know, about the same break that I'll give us. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'll condemn them for what they did, but I'll say, you know what? What you did is really no different than. In a, in, a, in a situation of stress in our own society. And so um, I, I think people like Hisham are important, 
and critical to the future of, of free thinking in the Arab world, and, and clearly Rami Khoury is as well. I mean, to say that there's no introspection when we've got two of the great introspective thinkers and writers who have a platform uh, in the media is, I think, a little bit uh, unfair to the, to, to the reality of what you do every day, both of you, and what others like you are doing against great odds. So um, it ain't perfect, um, but as Rami noted, our Constitution, we passed it, got voted out in the state of Virginia, it was 80, 82 to, no, I think it was 86 to 76 in favor. Hell of a lot more people could have voted, I'm sure, but women couldn't vote, blacks couldn't vote, um, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. Native Americans couldn't vote. You know, it, it took us it took us two centuries to get where we are, and we're still not perfect, and we're still we still have periods going backwards. But I think Egypt made progress and is continuing to make progress, and there are those who want to deny that progress, but the story's not written yet. And I think that they may have taken some steps backward, but there still is an, an, an energy and a, and a self-confidence among some in that society that will find a way to break free and, and do great things yet again. Now, I, I right. think, yeah. yeah. Uh, just before I yeah. 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 Uh, I need to leave in a minute, but yeah, I just yeah. want one last comment. I think one of the critical things that's going on in the region um, is that we have uh, all the players in society, most of whom used to be camouflaged under the table, mm -hmm. are now out into the mm -hmm. public. This is a very healthy be mm -hmm. starting uh, point for hopefully what will be a future process of evolution and, uh, and, and a better society ruled by the rule of law and, and, and the sort of ethics that are common to all of the members of society. So you've got the, the army is now out in public as a player in Egypt. It was always behind the scenes. Um, football hooligans, uh, Salafis, uh, Muslim brothers, uh, lefties, uh, nationalists, communists, uh, capitalists, uh, any group that you, that you want to talk about, they're now out uh, in the public. So the, the first step, I think, that has been achieved since the last three years is the uh, dual process of uh, citizens feeling that they're citizens, that they have rights and they have the ability to work to achieve those rights through a political process, including demonstrating and stuff, but including voting and writing and, and things like that. So there is a, we're starting to see the very, very early stages of the concept of popular sovereignty, that the ruling elite, the government that runs society, is ultimately answerable to the people. Now, the people will swing right and left, and we've seen in Egypt in the last four years, the Mubarak government, the first SCAF military government, then the Muslim Brothers, and now the second uh, military government. And in each case, people supported these or went uh, and opposed them and, and challenged them. Uh, and, and you're going to see a challenge to the Morsi, uh, to the Sisi government six months down the road when things are pretty bad still in socioeconomic political terms. And yesterday they, they indicted 537 or something uh, Muslim brothers all together were found guilty and given a murder uh, uh, death, <laughs> uh, sentence. death sentence, which probably will be overturned, but this was done, you know, this is ludicrous, this is yeah. comic, it's not even serious. Uh, uh, so the, the pendulum will swing uh, back and forth, and I think we should, we should, the important thing is to let the process uh, keep rolling along. But the assertion of citizenship and, and a sense of popular sovereignty are things that I think cannot be put back in the bottle. Uh, but it'll take decades for these things to, to gel into some kind of uh, coherence. Yeah, really quickly, Romley. Uh, now, I now what, no, I, what I want to do, because Romley has to leave, but I, I wanted to offer you the chance to ask some questions. Marwan's going to make a presentation of Romley, but if we, can, we still have about 20 minutes for the session, if that's OK. Uh, Romley's going to head over to Princeton to teach, I think. Uh, but Marwan is going to say a few words of thanks to, to Rami, and then uh, we'll continue the discussion. As, as you know, a tragedy happened in Villanova that was just about as bad as what's happening to, uh, in the Middle East and with the NCAAs. Um, Rami also shared this. Rami is a Syracuse fan, so I was hoping today, oh. <laughs> they didn't do well either. Uh, I was hoping today to give this to Rami and, and uh, uh, laugh at him, but we're, we're both in the same boat. So Rami, right. much madness. <laughs>
uh, in the audience, but if not, I'll just repeat the question. I wanted to, I had a few more questions, but I want to open it up. And Trudy, I know uh, you've, you've had your hand there patiently up. Uh, Trudy Rubin from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, if, if a Martian were to come to Earth and, uh, and you know, talk about what he thought about the survival of Christian communities in the Middle East, I think the Martian would immediately say they need dictators. And why would he say it? Because under dictators, the Christians were safer. And once the dictators fell, um, it, not only was there the chaos that we see, and you could repeat, you could describe it in country after country, in the Middle East, in Yugoslavia and Bosnia, and so forth. But not only was that, but in the Middle East, this assertion of citizenship that Rami spoke of, and I, I wish he was still here, it, I think, was more an assertion of anger, of frustration. But in country after country, those few who understood the concept of citizenship have been smashed or they have given up and embraced a new dictator. So what you had in Egypt was the liberals, those few in the square who made the Tafri revolution are either in jail now, or they've embraced Sisi, or they've gone home in frustration. Um, and a mass of voters looking for justice and education first elected the Muslim Brotherhood, which did not seek citizenship and still looked at Christians as dimmies in an Islam is the answer format, which looked at <coughs> non-Muslim uh, religions as second class. I mean, what Hisham was talking about. So I think in search for honesty, and I agree with what Hisham said, one has to look at why the one country that is sort of making it which is Tunisia. We don't know how it will end. Why Tunisia? And I think that Hisham was absolutely right. I mean, in, in, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking in a second, but I would like to throw this back. Why Tunisia? Um, Hisham said it had a dictator who brought in education, women's education, a dictator who made changes that have lasted. You also have a country where those people who went to the streets did think as citizens, and they actually formed political parties, which has not happened in Egypt. Those people who went to the streets, all these young people with Facebook, they didn't build political parties. They didn't go out and organize. You had empowered women in Tunisia, and you had the concept of being close to Europe and the Mediterranean idea. And so I, you know, I want to ask, um, if it's not Tunisia, then looking at the rest of the Arab world, do we see a chance for minorities without a far-sighted dictator like Bourguiba? Um, how does that concept of citizenship take root when other than Tunisia, we really do not see any sign that it is making any headway? Please do not assume that everybody has heard that. Oh, sorry. Well, the gist of uh, Trudy's question is whether only a dictator can uh, reform society and, and uh, protect the rights of citizens, including the, the minorities. Uh, I mean, Trudy said a lot, and I, I agree with, with, with some, and I ask, you know, have my questions about the, some of the assumptions. Burkiba was not your run-of-the-mill dictator. Burkiba did not kill people in the streets. Burkiba was a strong man. Burkiba had the legitimacy of the struggle against the French colonialists. And uh, he had a strong personality. But you cannot say that Burkiba was like Saddam Hussein or Hafiz al-Assad or Muammar al-Gaddafi. So we have to, you know, I think Burkiba may be the, uh, the Arab, quote unquote, enlightened strong man or enlightened, I don't see maybe the, the dictator, enlightened uh, patriarch, if you will. Uh, unfortunately, what we had in the Arab East were, you know, venality and brutality run amok in the case of Saddam Hussein, who literally waged a war of genocide against the Kurds. Uh, 
I mean, people tend to forget that. We know what uh, Gaddafi did, uh, pulverized the uh, Libyan society, the same thing with Syria. Um, I mean, as a liberal, I cannot fathom the idea of, you know, I, I need, a, you know, a dictator to enlighten dictator. I don't know if there are any of them now. Um, but this, by the way, was raised by, by, by social scientists and historians when they were talking about uh, Lee Kuan Yew in, 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 in Singapore and, uh, or even Pinochet and, and, and in South Korea, where you had uh, military leaders who controlled, you know, uh, maintained law and order, allowed the economy to flourish, and then gradually allowed the middle class that came up with this economic uh, you know, prosperity to, to, to participate and to partake in the political process. Um, it happened before, I don't know if it could happen in the Arab world, but you're right, uh, Tunisia was, was uh, 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 one of the reasons why Tunisia is somewhat successful now is, is the Bourguiba legacy. And also, uh, Tunisia was blessed with a small, small army. The curse of the Arabs in the East are their armies, who, as I said, you know, did their best to keep their people under, under, under the boot, so to speak. And this is true in Syria and Iraq and Libya and Yemen and Algeria, you name it. Um, and Egypt, Egypt has, I've always called Egypt as a military society. For 60 years, since the fall of the monarchy, Egypt was ruled directly or indirectly by the military. And this is one of the problems of Egypt. The Egyptian military has its own economy. You can never have a serious economic reform in Egypt without depriving the Egyptian military from its slice of Egyptian economy that they control. But you don't have a debate about that in Egypt. Nobody dares to talk about that in Egypt. This is not America's problem. This is not Israel's problem. This is an Egyptian problem. And they don't discuss that. They never, they, I've never seen a serious discussion of this. Nobody dares raise that issue whether under Mubarak or Scaf or, or even Mursi or now. So, uh, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I remember when the Islamists were organizing the first election, uh, parliamentary election in Egypt after uh, Mubarak, they were knocking on doors with lists of names, with laptops, getting everybody's names, introducing their own candidates and their own programs and, and they did local politics. They understood what Tipo Nino used to talk about. All politics is local politics. Our people reminded me of my youth in 1968 when the student revolution took over in, in, in Paris and in Mexico and other places. You know, we were idealists, had long hair longer than yours, demonstrating in the streets. We knew what we don't like, but we had absolutely no idea about organizing and doing politics, retail politics. The Egyptian, our people that we supported early on, the liberals, the secularists, the educated, those who believe in equality with women and all that, you know, they felt that we achieved the victory. We kicked the dictator out and things will be, you know, honky-dory now. They didn't organize, they didn't knock on doors, they didn't, they didn't say, they didn't do anything. No wonder the Islamists won. And they were always in because they are organized. Because they talk the language of the people. We don't. Our people didn't. And they are not doing it right now, too. And in fact, now we are seeking the you know, protection of Sisi, so to speak. Um, it is going to take a long time. You know, as, as a, as a, make, let me make a confession. As a former Marxist, uh, I'm fond of quoting Antonio Gramsci, who is one of my favorite philosophers. I studied four years of philosophy here, so I might as well use it once in a while. <laughs> Gramsci has one of the best description of transition. He said, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying, the new is not born yet, and in the interregnum, a variety of morbid symptoms appear. Just think of this. A variety of morbid symptoms appear. And what you see in the Arab world, is that morbid symptoms that we talk about. And it's going to take a long time. You know, uh, I, I, I fancy myself as a student of history too. And it's going to take a long time. A few years ago, I went back and read a book that I read in college. I'm sure my wife knows it, all of these people know it. Jim, I'm sure read it. Uh, it's the, the liberal thought 
in the in the, in the Arab Soul and Deliberate Age by uh, Albert Horani. It is stunning. Go back and read that book. He is talking about the same debates that we are having today about Egypt, about the role of state with the citizens, about the role of the Arab world and Muslim world with the West, about gender issues, about uh, uh, you know the role of Islam in public life. It is amazing. We haven't made serious inroads. We are still talking about the same issues. And, and that's, it, it, it is, uh, I mean, if you have time, go back and read it. It's just, it's fascinating. And, uh, this is the uh, Arab Thought and the Liberal Age by Albert Horani. And uh, that's why, I mean, I, I, as I said, I, in the foreseeable future, I'm very pessimistic. I expect to see more bloodletting in Iraq and in Syria and in Egypt and other places. Uh, the economic problems in Egypt are, are so daunting, believe me, few men and women in Egypt understand them and nobody wants to talk about them. And, and uh, th that's why I, you know, I keep talking about uh, you know, engaging in self-criticism and asking all these questions and I have, have, you know, I mean Jim is right when he talks about national dialogue and all that. That requires intellectual integrity. I really don't see the Arab intellectuals doing it. I, I really don't see many Arab journalists doing it. Only few people do it. But it's not enough, really. And, and I'm sick and tired, to be honest with you, of dumping all our problems on the West and on the Israelis. I mean, the Israelis created so, much, so many problems for us, and the West created so many problems for us. But it, enough of this. We, we have been supposedly owning our, our, our present for decades now. And, and I always use India as an example in Egypt, or India and Pakistan as an example. You know, Indians are not obsessed now with, with British colonialism. And believe me, I mean, Jim was talking about British colonialism. Marx himself said positive things about British colonialism in India. Marx himself said positive things about British colonialism in India. Because it tried to break down that ossified set, you know, system of, 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 uh, of uh, stratification in India. British colonialism connected the whole Indian subcontinent with the railroad system. British, British colonialism introduced English to India, which unified India. British colonialism created parliamentary India. British colonialism you know, uh, uh, taught people to respect the right of pri private property. I'm not preaching colonialism, but even, you know, even smart people can learn you know, from these experiences. The Indians incorporated all of these things and developed them, with, but they're still struggling with it. It's not a perfect democracy, obviously. But look at India. It goes to war with Pakistan. They beat the crap out of the Pakistanis, and the Indian army goes back to the barracks. The Pakistani army, when it gets defeated, does what the Arab armies do. They, go, they ride the first tank to the presidential palace and stage a coup. Do you want to Yeah, Jim has nothing to add. And if, if I could just say, Rudy, I mean, I, we talked about this a little bit before. I, I wanna, I'm always interested in applying sort of an idea or a thought uh, and the implication of your question. I wonder where we, we could apply this. Uh, in Syria, it seems you could. And you, when you look at distinguished diplomats like Ryan Crocker saying, look, we need to go back to Assad and work I'm with him. No, you're not saying that. Yeah, it's, it's an observation, but I, I'm, a, I'm trained as a policy analyst yeah. of what do we take? Uh, from that observation and how to implement that into policy. And to me, when I look around the whole region, even including those Gulf countries that have not seen substantial change, and you measure it up against the demographic bubble, the social pressures, the economic pressures, which we all know very well in Egypt, but it's coming to these other countries as well. It's not a sustainable model for the protection of Christians. It may have worked in, in a very limited sense, but I, even I'm skeptical based on what I've learned and heard, is it didn't work because it didn't create this broader sense of citizenship or nationhood. Maybe in Tunisia it worked in a small sense, but that may be so sui generis that it can't be applied in any real sense um, moving forward, which is, again, I think I hope uh, later on uh, of next few questions we can talk a little bit more about U.S. policy as well, and, and over lunch for those of you who are staying and coming to that, uh, focus on it on that. But Elizabeth, I know you wanted to mention, um, and let me bring the mic down just to avoid the problem before. We only have one mic. We'll have a mic for the next session. Okay. Sure, thanks to the panelists. Um, I wanted to go to a different space, institutional space, and ask you to comment on education. 
um, and in particular link this perhaps to the U.S. foreign policy and what the U.S. might be able to do, um, whether under secularist or Islamist regimes in the region, um, education is the space for the intergenerational transmission of ideas about citizenship and who's in, who's out, uh, who's equal before the state, who's not. And regarding secularists, um, as far as I'm concerned, they've been a catastrophic failure for um, protection of religious minorities. I mean, the Islamists are batting clean up on everything that the secularists have done for decades. I mean, I'll speak more about that in my own comments. But public education is a space where um, generations are, are you know, trained, they're, they're taught about their own history, who's part of their own history, who's written in, who's written out, and who belongs. And so I wonder if you could say a little bit about either the discussions in country or in particular what the USERF is doing, and I served eight years on the USERF, so this was an issue we were particularly concerned with when it comes to education reform, um, teacher training, textbooks, etc. And this is something that the Arab Development Report really focused a lot on, the pretty um, dismal state of public education and the consequences, economic and others, um, in, in the region. Thank you. Great. Maybe uh, Jim and Sean, no. just take notes. We can do Jim. questions. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I learned a great deal, hi Jim, um, from uh, the three of you, the four of you really, and so thank you very much. My comment is that um, I, I notice a tendency to what I would call reductionism. It's really not religious, it's, it's political, or it's really not political, it's religious, or it's not religious, it's economic. Uh, and it seems to me we shouldn't take an either or approach as a, generally as a historian, it's all of those things, and they're interlocked. I mean, uh, we know that uh, people do horrible things which is to their own economic disadvantage, their own political disadvantage, their own military disadvantage. I mean, think of the, the destruction of the Jews in the Holocaust. The nutty German military were using up these fantastic resources, shipping them off to get killed, when they should have been using them to defend against the, the Russian army. We do nutty things, and so it's not an either or. Um, that's just a comment. I, I wonder, and this is awesome, from naivete, nobody ever mentioned anything about Morocco, and that seems to be kind of a, a sort of not such a bad kind of um, state, an uh, Arab state these days. Uh, and I wonder if you have any comments of how come they're slipping through and sort of slightly improving and not having any disasters. Can we take one more question, if you don't mind? Maybe you can identify yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Len Swidler, who just spoke, is the head of the Dialogue Institute. Eddie, can you? Uh, um, Eddie has a woman. I come from Bethlehem, Palestine. So I'm one of these few Christians who live there. Um, my coming to this meeting was primarily to hear about the plight of Christians in the Middle East, which is a very serious problem. Unfortunately, uh, everybody diverged to try and solve the problems of the whole Middle East. Uh, these problems existed uh, long before the latest, uh, uh, the latest uh, events that are pushing Christians out of the Middle East. Uh, I, I like to point out that uh, Christian immigration of the Middle East has been going on, but uh, it has been precipitated by the Iraq war. Uh, many Muslims especially, it drove Muslims to create an Islamic fundamentalism throughout the Middle East. And this Islamic fundamentalist saw Christians as uh, friends of the West. <coughs> and that's what precipitated the current problem, whether it's in Iraq or Syria or Jordan or anywhere else. The other issue is when you ask Israelis <coughs> uh, who gave them Palestine, they don't tell you that it was Lloyd George or Balfour or, uh, or anybody else. They tell you God gave us the land. And the same with the Kurds who claim that along Iraq and Syria belongs to them when in fact that area belong 
to the Armenians long before they showed up. And uh, <clears throat> America is uh, singing praises of the Kurds, when in fact the Kurds were instrumental in uh, pushing out the Christians from northern Iraq, especially the Assyrians. And this has never been discussed. The uh, thousands of people leaving the Christians, <laughs> the, the thousands of Christians leaving the Middle East has been caused by a spread of Islamic fundamentalism, which has been ignited by American and uh, Anglo activity in the Middle East. And this is what should be addressed. Mm -hmm. The other issues are, are there are not major issues, but that does not affect the recent immigration of Christians. Great. Thank you very much. Maybe Jim can go first, and then uh, Hisham can respond to the three questions. I don't remember them all, but I will, will speak to Eddie. Um, you're right, Christian uh, migration has been, well, population migration generally from the region has been uh, continuing now for more than a century. Um, the great wave here was largely Christian at the turn of the last century. Um, but there was Muslim immigration as well, but it was to other places other than America. I would always get asked why would we have large Bethlehem and Ramallah populations in America. It's because there was an affinity to the West. There was a closeness to the West. Then. And once the first wave came, then they sort of like an avalanche, you know, sort of the, the rock hits and then everything piles up behind it. It was a place to go. Um, uh, there's a huge Palestinian uh, community, non-Christian, um, in other parts of the world. Um, but in, a, in, the, in, in, a, in the U.S. and in many places in Latin and South America, you have large Palestinian communities that are Christian. Uh, in Africa, you have some Muslim populations. In Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, in other parts of the, the Gulf, you have large Palestinian Muslim populations because they could go. Uh, and, and actually, if you had a choice uh, during the, the oil boom, uh, the logical decision where to go if you were Muslim was the Gulf. If you were a Christian, the logical place to go was to America because the streets were paved in gold at the turn of the last century. Uh, the Lebanese, similarly, you know, my family came, um, my dad came in 1923, my mom's family came in 1898 uh, because they could. Um, the doors were closed in the early 20s because we were Syrian and considered, uh, what was it, your senator Reed from here in Pennsylvania called us Syrian trash and said there's no place for Syrian trash in America, and we fell under the Asian Exclusion Act, and we were locked out. But then the doors opened up again, and the numbers came in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and and, uh, and the, your, since the, at the time when, when, the, when King Farouk fell and, and the Nasser took over, a lot of Christian Coptics left and came to America. Um, and they were viewed as having been close to the early, the old regime. And so they felt persecution and they left as did the Greeks and other uh, uh, European communities that had settled in, in mainly in Alexandria and had become business elites. Um, but it sparked again with the creation of Israel. Like you have a, a, a mass evacuation, not only of Palestinians, but also of others who felt the turbulence in the region was going to be unsettling for their lives. Uh, the Iraq war produced more. Um, the current uprising in Syria, more. Um, Cops largely left, I mean, large numbers left, as I said, in the, in the early 50s and continued to come again because once the rock settles, there's a place to pile up behind. And they, they came to northern New Jersey and Cleveland and areas, uh, other areas where Coptic communities settled. But the numbers grew when the Muslim Brotherhood took over. Actually, after Mubarak fell, even though, as is incorrectly noted during the Mubarak era, it was not uh, comfortable for, for cops. But their numbers were large enough that they had an internal security in the community that gave them the ability to stay. They didn't evacuate as this much smaller Iraqi community uh, did. Um, they stayed. And um, the, I think that the interesting thing today is um, we don't have U.S. numbers on 
religion. We don't do that in our census, but even in, in our asylum request, you know, but the, the, single, the second largest group of asylees in the last three years are Egyptian after, um, after China, which, which has a much larger population to begin with. But we don't know whether they're copped or not. Uh, we assume that they are, but they've been coming, in other words, in large numbers in recent years. Um, the issue of Morocco is intriguing, as is the issue of Jordan, um, as I think also the situation in Kuwait for Christians, and, which doesn't have an indigenous Christian population, and the UAE, which also doesn't have an indigenous Christian